Radiothon 2014 is here. It's to keep joy out, proud and loud. Joy Melbourne Inc, as we are registered as, is a volunteer-based community radio station for the uh, wider gay and lesbian and allied diverse community. Hi, my name is Chris, Chris Ferno. I've been a long-term volunteer here at Joy, nearly 20 years now, and I've been a member all those times. And I was part of the original crew, you could almost say, when we started uh, broadcasting in the early 90s. And you've got to remember that today the gay community is quite out loud and proud, but it wasn't always that way. Uh, 20 years ago, there was a lots of shame being dumped on the community from, uh, from newspapers, from radio sources, uh, from disreputable people, people who were scared of us, who people who were ignorant of what we were really about. And we found it appropriate to consider having our own voice and controlling the message. And we were also at that particular time suffering from the ravages of the AIDS crisis. And it was a medical crisis that wasn't being managed by profession professionally resolving um, medicines or solutions to the virus. And, and we had a lot of our community dying in our arms and we needed to actually support them by letting them hear their community on the radio. Our founding member, John Oliver, still member number one, still active in the organisation, uh, he tried to get a couple of hours on one of the existing community radio stations at that time but they weren't particularly receptive to the thought of oh we'll be sponsoring gay people oh my goodness we don't agree with their messages oh we, we, we can't take this any further so having been knocked back it even prompted John into a, a stronger attempt to create his own radio station for the gay community and and away we went on AIDS Day in 1993 the 1st of December that was a Wednesday we went to, to air just for that one day a national day of mourning of celebration of support and for uh, three days later on the weekend Saturday and Sunday we had another separate two-day license uh, to broadcast for the weekend. So we did 48 hours continuous broadcasting. Uh, that meant that to put on 48 hours of radio for just a two-day two weekend, uh, we had to have a huge amount of human resources. So lots of people popped up on lots of programs, but then with the experience and the support of people coming out of the woodwork, ah, oh, I can contribute this. Oh, you want a tech program? I'll do the tech program. You want boot scoot? Oh, we can put boot scoot music on and tell about the private dances that are going. And we started to get uh, community involvement. But we had listeners. We'd already been advertising in some of the street press that we were getting together as a radio station and broadcasting. And um, we found there was lots of public support for that as well. Uh, so when we really got to air and we got the feedback and the response, that really made us go ahead. Well, I'm Will Lanting. I'm working on the program called World Wide Wave, which is dealing with LGBTI news and current affairs. Um, I've been with Joy for about six months now. I, I hid my sexuality for 33 plus years. Um, certainly in the last four or five years, I discovered Joy. It was, it was there for me. Um, it was also a component to get my confidence in coming out 
and I, it, I ultimately, as I said, gave me a place to come to and and be around my own and to grow with it and find myself confidence and you know, obviously new challenges. So it's certainly a very important for me. It's been would be it's definitely important for a lot of people out there who are struggling with their sexuality and um, it just gives them somewhere to go and somewhere to get the information and empower them so joy is very very important for that well being a presenter at joy um, particularly when i was doing my bisexuality show means that i am very open and emotionally equipped to discuss that issue and i'm I have the, well, mostly I'm emotionally equipped to actually discuss a lot of the issues that our community is facing. So people who have questions, I have enough information to be like, oh, I, I can actually answer this pretty well. I have this information ready for me. I've practiced talking about it. I practice once a week on live radio. So um, it also just helps firstly to, to, again, when you know that there's something you can work towards, it definitely can help alleviate any frustrations and anger you can feel or I can feel when there is a lot of injustice because it does feel that even if it's something I can do, I have a place where I can go and work on something. And it might just be a very small thing that's not heard by many people, but it's still an action I can take. So joy, joy allows everybody who is a part of it and encourages them to take actions. And I think one of the worst feelings is being part of a marginalised group and feeling that there is nothing you can do to help anybody or yourself um, and that you just have to cop it. And I think joy, um, while of course, you know, there's always, there's always, you know, stuff going on within joy as well, it really does allow for people who are passionate and who have things that they want to say and want to change, be able to get that out a little bit. As for skill set, well, I, I basically walked in here with zero. I'd been on the radio only, only a few times. Um, it's, that it was thrown in at the deep end, um, but my skill set has just been exponential. The things that I'm learning every every week I come in, um, just learning how to edit, learning how to run the panel, um, just getting the confidence to talk and just to present. And now I'm uh, producing my first shows, getting people structuring the show. So yeah, we've gone from like zero to full blast in six months. And yeah, I've still got a lot to learn, but uh, we've got a great team behind us supporting us. So. And I think it also just teaches you how to engage with people who think differently to you because the queer community is not monolithic. People have different opinions and different thoughts and different perspectives and it kind of helps you learn how to hear different perspectives. And I think you know, people kind of assume we're in a little echo chamber in, in, a, you know, in the Melbourne, but I do actually believe that I've heard a lot of different thoughts on joy about you know, if, we, if marriage is a good thing, you know, about how we should be handling um, you know, um, sexism in the queer community and what political parties people go for. You'd think, you know, you'd be really, I was really surprised to find out that, you know, firstly, there are a lot of people who are religious at Joy and how those things can work together. And I think when you're in this space, it's a lot easier also to, to know you can ask someone and they're not going to judge you for asking. So there are some things I don't understand very well about people who are intersex, but my friend Andrea is very happy for me to ask because she knows I'm coming from a good place. So you can develop those connections and relationships at Joy that give you those insights and can allow you to really expand and to sit and listen to people who might have very different perspectives and might know more about a particular topic than you can because of their lived experiences. When we first went to air, we were, everything was delivered live, as much as life could be. Uh, if we needed to do an overnight music program, we'd actually have to pre-record that on huge reel-to-reel, 12-inch reel-to-reel um, tape recorders and hope that the tape didn't break or the spool fall off the tape recorder. Uh, that was okay, That we survived that without too much drama. This is before we could actually burn CDs and play them. Uh, but that meant that we normally would have had to have a second studio, except that we were still broadcasting only on weekends, maybe a four-day weekend. The other three days, we had the studio sitting there. That's when people would come in and they would pre-record a program and somehow we, it would get to air, whether it be on a, a, as a CD, a series of CDs together just linked uh, or whether it was a, a pre-recorded tape. Uh, we had mini discs at one stage. That wasn't too hard, but then it would still require someone to be sitting there overnight feeding it into the machine. Um, we did have one member. Her name was Cara. Cara Sell. 
and it was a, a eight disc CD carousel and you could load up a whole series of double CDs and whack them in and they would just shuffle through and you would get a long amount of play except when Cara went on strike or something got stuck and the uh, CD didn't m move on to the next one and someone would ring up, oh we're off air and so we'd have to run down, break in to fix it all up and get it going to air again. Uh, technology has moved on so much far now that we do uh, have a smartphone app so that anywhere in the world we can broadcast, we can receive our own signal. So that's one thing. Uh, we have uh, current Twitter and Facebook feeds going out. Uh, social media is a, an ex important part of our connection to the community because we can warn people coming up or say a, someone's podcast has just been posted. Um, some of our shows are only podcast only, which is good. But then we have seasonal shows uh, like Chicks Talking Footy, which is for women's football. And that's only, of course, in the muddy season. Uh, other, thing, other things uh, are seasonal as well, but we, are, we have four grids a year and three months each. And there is a degree of rotation of the shows within the, the year yearly plan. So Triple Bypass, which is Joy's first bisexuality program, started about a year ago. We had our year, one year anniversary last week actually. Um, and that started because uh, Andy, who is a producer here, uh, who is a gay man, actually had been trying to put together a bisexual show. And, he, and um, because I was very outspoken about being bisexual with the people I'd worked with, my name just kind of floated up as someone who was around and happy to talk about that. And so I was approached and he'd actually brought in someone from Bent TV and another one, another woman he knew. And so we kind of met and talked about what we wanted to do for the show and why it was important. And then we had a go at it and just kind of, it started off as a bit of a mess and just kind of slowly became a bit more cohesive. And yeah, and at first it was on at 10 p.m. and now it's on at nine on Tuesdays. And um, that's been a really great experience. There's, there is not a lot in around uh, on resources for people who are bisexual or non-monosexual, so pansexual, attracted to more than one gender, um, however, you know, they want to choose to identify with that. So it's been really interesting to see the response we get from that. Like, we get people emailing us from around the world talking about finding this podcast because we podcast all of our shows and, and being quite surprised and really happy to be able to hear what a bisexual community sounds like because we don't have a particularly tight-knit community because not a lot of us come out because there's a lot of stigma around bisexuality in the queer community. So it can be quite difficult. Um, and one of the reasons I came to Joy was to be very openly loud about my bisexuality and the issues I was, I felt the community had to address with that. So um, being able to do a show about it, it's been really positive, uh, particularly because for a lot of us, it was our first time just sitting in a room talking about bisexual issues, just with people who are bisexual, and not having to worry that you were going to offend somebody by discussing same-sex relationships or, you know, heterosexual relationships, because you can have either or. And, and we've also been able to, with that show, you know, have our friends on who, uh, who give us different perspectives, because when you kind of look at bisexuality as a breakdown of the spectrum, so this idea of, you know, it's not just one or the other, it's everything in between. That also can apply for people who are non-binary, for people who are intersex, this idea of everything is not rigid and boxed. And so I think that's something that the community is slowly moving towards, but it, it's quite nice to be able to have a few rants every now and again. Some of the harder topics that we've had to deal with is some of the uh, violence towards gay people in Chechnya. Um, uh, we're also dealing with some of the issues with Iran, um, and death penalty uh, countries. There's still eight countries around the world which exercise the death penalty for your sexuality. And you know, talking about and getting information on those issues can be extremely challenging at times. I did a program on um, the rates of Indigenous incarceration in Victoria, which I spoke with the uh, Victorian Commissioner for Indigenous Young People, Andrew Giacomos. That was just after Dondale. Um, and that story had broken and we'd seen, you know, these cases of really horrific abuse and I was reading through the statistics and finding out that the rates of incarceration in Victoria are really, really high and they're mostly for quite minor things and that was very intense. Um, obviously I was also covering the plebiscide debate as that happened last year. I'm covering that again now um, and I think that was really difficult particularly as we were getting contacted every time something else was found that was going to show how bad the debate was going to be so anytime there was any stickers about 
you know, families are a mother and a father, anything else is wrong. Anything else like that came out, we had people contacting us and wanting to talk. We had a bomb threat um, one night in the studio, which was pretty intense. And this was before the campaign started. And so I think that kind of a constant deluge was very difficult, um, particularly when you're doing interviews by yourself and you're just talking to somebody and going over these really quite personal details. They felt personal because obviously they're talking about queer people and um, I'm a queer person. So that, that was difficult. That was really hard for everybody, I think, covering it. The gay community hung together well because of the adverse situations. Um, having gone to air, we started to expand uh, the concept of the gay community into people who wouldn't be going normally to, to pubs and clubs. And dance parties were fairly rare in those days and they're fairly tame as well but that's okay. The 90s were the, the development of dance parties. Uh, one of the things that actually happened in uh, 94 was a, a raid on one of our private club parties by the Victoria Police. It wasn't a particularly proud moment for the Victoria Police, but they um, raided a, a dance, a respectable, reasonably well-managed gay dance party, 463 patrons. Um, they were strip searched, completely down to the bare skin. And included in some of the patrons were people who were transitioning. So their external appearance mightn't have, been, uh, you know, uh, mightn't have reflected what was under their garments. And so they were extremely traumatised, having to strip down, and everybody was searched, cavity searched, for drugs. Now, this was totally over the top. Uh, two people were arrested, the charges were dropped. No drugs were found, no drugs on the premises. Um, and on the basis of, you know, people being let out seven o'clock in the morning to find their way home from a, a, a mid, midnight dance party it was, you know, uh. So uh, some local lawyers got onto this and the Age itself, uh, as a newspaper, reported uh, the out of control cops. And you've got to remember too, that it was the old crusty homophobic cops that were basically behind this, oh, we'll show these pofters, I think, all three. Uh, however, uh, there was some gay legal fraternity who took on the case and they challenged the police and the police case was thrown out and $10 million damages were awarded against the police. Now, for Melbourneites, this was our Stonewall moment. So we, it's our private uprising, our personal uprising here in Victoria. But from that, there was a change of mind of the police. Oh, we can't get away with this anymore. Uh, we'll have to change our practices and procedures and all the, the bad stuff that was in the police force gradually got shaken out. And out of that also came the gay and lesbian liaison officers, which are, or who are, part of the normal police force these days in all police stations so if people come in say I've been hassled I've been puffed or bashed or whatever you like to call it they can go to a cop shop and there will be someone sympathetic to the situation and will treat it with respect and take it on board properly. Um, there have been some other stories I found just frustrating to cover. For example, I, talk, I did a story on Castor Semenya, the, the runner from South Africa, and there was a lot of frustration there because very few people were willing to speak on the topic because the intersex community is so widely mis misunderstood and it's like there's no real visibility for them, so it was very hard to track anyone down who would actually be willing to speak. And so there was that kind of frustration of understanding that there are these really important stories that are part of our acronym and yet for some reason weren't really getting much space. In the news, uh, in the news rotation, but I was, I felt very happy I could do something about that. So, after Dondale, I felt really upset and despondent. But then I could turn around and be like, well, what can I actually do? People should know what it's like in Victoria. Who can I contact? And so, 
the do, being able to do the program gave me actually a lot of sense of being able to not just have to be helpless with things that I found very distressing. So we, the Joy as a radio station um, was right in the middle of all this this uprising and out of it we've survived. We're now, uh, we got our license in uh, 2008 by going to the Melbourne Town Hall and appearing before the Australian Broadcasting there and we delivered our case and the board went away and deliberated and we got one of the few licenses. Uh, unfortunately it's only a Melbourne Metro license uh, but even so we've got a nice big strong candle up the top of the antenna and uh, we, we broadcast to the broader Melbourne community and of course now we're online and we do podcasts and we also incorporate now video audio visual. Joy gives to the community uh, a sense of connection, a sense of empowerment um, and also most importantly information, you know, a central point for where people can listen to and um, it just gives a lot of people company within the LGBTI community which I also think is one of the most important things. I think being able to even just start those conversations and kind of build and remind each other why it's so important to be very open about discussing these things has been not only just important for us, but it's been important for um, everyone who's been able to listen to the show. So yes, we've um, Joy's been around for 23 years now. We're coming up for our 25th year, or 24th year this uh, December, and then 25 next year. That's totally incredible. Um, we have about 300 volunteers on a total rotation. We broadcast seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, we also broadcast via the Community Radio Network. We podcast, we're on iTunes. Uh, we are out in a digital form without actually having to go up the digital uh, antenna here in Melbourne. It's basically given me a home. Um, coming out for me was at a very late age. I really had nowhere to, to turn to, so um, yeah, that's that's basically what Joy's given me. We've all kind of come together and learned a lot about why we all want community so much, I think, and whenever we bring people on the show who usually have had no experience with the bisexual community or understand that it is a community, when we kind of hear that people telling us that this is what they want and they just want to be able to sit there and talk about things, we just kind of want to go off and just build more and more things. So whether it's like, you know, the radio show will stay, but as far as other things, it will be built on top of that. Uh, I think we're hoping, maybe not catalysts, but we're just hoping to kind of slowly build the bees' presence a little bit. Um, here And here's a pretty good place to start. Sometimes we advertise ourselves as your, not your biological family, but your logical family. <laughs>